Hi teammates, my name is Sean J. McCall and I am your guest for the Euro Step where we try to get behind the curtain of European basketball, basketball in general, with guests that share their experiences, their lives, and how things have gone for them. And with the hope that it'll help someone out there in one way, shape, or form. Tonight is a, is a special, um, special night because Actually, I've ever already had my guest on before, and for some reason, Instagram didn't save it to my to my archives, so I couldn't post it. That's why we're doing this one. So there's a lot of stuff that I'm going to skip over from our last chat, some more of the personal stuff, and I want to get right down to the nitty gritty of her life as an agent and what might be able to help someone uh, looking for an agent or anything in that situation. So. I'm going to get Lauren on right now. So. There she should be on in just a second. There she goes. Hey, Sean. Hi, Lauren. How you doing? Good. Thank you for hopping on. So I have to I have to admit some something uh, before we get started. If any of you guys know me, you, you know I'm pretty much a, a, an airhead, and I very often mix up dates. So I did it this time with Lauren that I actually requested that we meet on Tuesday. And then I started broadcasting and it's going to be on Monday. So um, Lauren hit me up today. It was like, Sean, you got the wrong date. I was like, oh, shit. No, so lucky I was checking my the stories on Instagram. It was around that time. You know, I'm getting dinner ready for the kids. I'm like, wait, he's talking about tonight. I'm quickly checking. <laughs> the like, lost here. And then I... <laughs> shared all of your stories all the posts about this <laughs> once see it was monday so yeah, I'm a, that's my bad lauren my party. bad <laughs> no we're good so tell your husband i said thanks and did i owe him a bottle of wine and uh for letting you get away from the kids uh tonight and no um and i see the glam team was there so thank you i appreciate it <laughs> yeah it a last minute uh quick hustle type situation <laughs> Yeah, because it was, you know, it's like 40 degrees Celsius. So, yeah, it, yeah it's Fahrenheit. That's over 100 degrees. Yeah. Over, brutally hot. Um, so, yeah, I was not really in any sort of state or appearance to be doing a live video. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. Good to have been taken. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to jump right in it. And um, so basically, I'm going to ask you almost the same questions that I asked you before. Um, it's a couple that I that I added. There's one from a teammate that I already have. Oh yeah, by the way, if any of you would like to comment or question during the broadcast, like I said before, hit the comment um, thing or the the speech bubble with the question mark, and I'll try to infuse your questions into the broadcast. So we're gonna jump right into it. Um, yeah, how did being a player influence you as an agent? Being a former player influenced you as an agent? Well, obviously, having been through the player side of it myself, playing overseas, adjusting to the transition of going from the States to a completely different culture, having been through pretty much all the highs and the lows that are out there, having been, for me, at the top of my game in France, mm -hmm. blowing me out overseas, um, getting signed into EuroLeague, getting fired... So having lived through all these experience my, experiences myself, obviously, which are a day-to-day -day thing for our players, has really helped me really understand kind of what they're going through, how they're feeling, how certain things might impact their decisions or way of viewing things. Mm -hmm. So it helps me connect with my players and also be able to represent them from a really empathetic place, you know, be able to really uh, defend their interests uh, with an understanding of what it's like, what they're going right. through on a daily basis. Does, does that affect you somehow negatively that you do understand what the players are going through, yet mm -hmm. this is a business and, you know, you have to you have to go walk a fine line between the business side and having empathy and things like that? Does it affect you any any way negatively that you were a former player? It did initially in the beginning because I feel like as players, we're not really understanding of the whole process of everything that's out there, seeing things um, from all sides. We have a tendency just as people as it is, but also as players to only look at things and how they directly impact us right. and take into account the business side of things. So, for example, when some things would happen, I'd get a more emotionally 
uh, invested than I should have been uh, mm -hmm. because I was experiencing it as I was as a former player and not as an agent. So right. with time, I've been able to resolve both sides and be able to form my own special way of doing things where I don't lose that empathy, that understanding, and yet bring now the business aspect to it and mold it into my own unique form of agent representation. Right. Um, since January 22, there's the new fee rule concerning the commission fees and that now the players are responsible for paying the agent's commission fee. Before it was more that the, that or it wasn't more, it was the, the way it went that the teams paid the agent's commission. Mm -hmm. I have a view on that and I'll say it in, in, a, in a minute, but I'd like to get your viewpoint on how that, how that changes your representation with, with athletes. And mm -hmm. do you think it was a good idea to change it? It's such a tricky subject with so many nuances to it that it's yeah. not a yes or no answer. There's some aspects of it I think were for the be were for the better, and some I think weren't at all. Um, it does make things in certain countries less so in others a lot trickier to sign them and not have the players pay the commission. But right. the not officially be the player's agent. You say that you're signing the player for the club. So technically you're the club's agent, but that's all on paper. But in reality, you are representing the player. Um, but if you are on Eurobasket, you know, because a lot of agents like to claim their players. Wrongfully <laughs> uh, so, sometimes. Also, yes. And so um, on Eurobasket and then with FIBA and all that, they'll see that when uh, they do the letter of clearance. So you have to put the agent representing so the clubs right. will put the agent and then um, it can cause some issues. But as of now, for all the countries, we've been able to work out with the teams to where they're paying the commissions. It just takes a little bit more um, back road style negotiations to figure out how to do that. And luckily in France, uh, we've, we have our own way of doing things. So while we're respecting the feeble rules, we just officially declare ourselves as the club's agents, even though clearly uh, in reality, we represent the players. But it's like I said, all for uh, FIBA, all for uh, the basketball federations, just to be able to get the clubs to pay um, the agent fee directly to the agent and not have the players pay us because that just can create so many problems in my opinion. There's some benefits to it in that the agent now, in order to represent the player to the best of their ability, if the age, if the player's paying the agent, um, then it's a different kind of relationship. And one that exactly. I, it's a very different kind of relationship. So I feel like agents ha are expected now to do a lot more things for that money, if that makes sense. So it's kind of scary in that sense. Now we're going to be wearing even more hats as players who ask, well, what about skills development? What about mental coaches, this, that, and the other, I am paying you. So there's a lot more expectations than before. So that's good in the sense that agents now need, are now expected to do more for their money. But at the same time, we can only do so much. Do you think it will, it will affect the quality of what agents are able to bring to the table because now they have to wear more hats? <sighs> it can it really can. And it might obviously impact uh, agents wanting to work with certain players. If they see that there's too much work the quality of the player, they're not going to want to get involved. And right. they're going to start getting really specific, really selective. Um, selective, exactly, about the players that they take on. They want to make sure they're players that are going to be making the money so that they can pay it. Um, it takes a lot of trust between a player and an agent for that to say, okay, you need to pay me uh, my agent fee. It's already like that in the WNBA, uh -huh. um, for example. And with my partner agent, uh, Mike Count, I've seen uh, you know, how that can sometimes go wrong. You feel awkward asking your player, pushing your player to pay you the money that you're owed. Uh, it is a business relationship that makes it even more so and kind of takes away from the personal aspect sometimes. That's interesting that you say that because from my viewpoint as someone who is very pro player, mm -hmm. um, when I first heard about the rule, I thought it would be great for the player agent relationship because it kind of forces the agent not to work for the club, but more for the player. You, you, you understand what I mean? From, from an outsider looking in, it seems like, okay, 
I have to, if I'm a player, I have to pay you your commission. That means there's that cuts some of the, the of the um, conflict of interest between clubs and agents. And you know, you've heard all the stories. Um, the player gets fired. The club says to the agent, "I'll take another one of your players as consideration, but I don't want to pay as much money in the uh, settlement." So let's not make the greatest deal for this player. It's happened. We all know it's happened. And mm -hmm. so I thought, okay, that cuts away a little bit those conflicts of interest. But now that you say it, it is a, it's, it's very, it's a very complex dynamic. Very, very there. Like you said, there are some benefits to it, but in that case, it'll be such a, a case by case basis. Right. Right. But now with the new rules where a player can fire an agent within 30 days, agents aren't going to want to invest in their players anymore because they've put in a lot of money in players. Right. And that's, that's true. Fire them in 30 days. Agents aren't going to invest money anymore if, if there's no guarantees behind it. So that's also scary. Mm -hmm. uh, How long do you think the dust, until the dust settles with this issue? Because always when there's change, there's, there's pushback, right? Always. So, and everybody has to kind of get used to it. And so, from the, from the players that are, were in our generation, my generation, um, yeah, it, it's we didn't have anything like that. But now the players that are coming out, let's say this year, they have to deal with that fact, and they won't know the other side that mm -hmm. the clubs paid it in a way. Mm -hmm. So, how long do you think it's going to take for the dust to settle and everybody to get used to it and and kind of uh, yeah, that it that it just kind of becomes normal because. Before it was normal. Club pays, player doesn't pay. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, with any sort of change, there's a transition period. So I think we need to let that pass and kind of see what happens. Is there's a lot of growing pains right now. You know, yeah. uh, you know, reaching out saying, "Oh, you signed the letter of clearance, but and you're the player agent, but the club's paying you. How does that work?" So it's kind of also us getting our ducks in a row. Okay, how can we do this to where we continue to get paid by the clubs? Because that's the ultimate goal. That's Right now, honestly, my goal and one that we're doing is continuing to get the clubs to pay and finding different ways around this feeble rule in order to do that. Obviously, we might not be able to do that in every case, but uh, for now, especially in France, as that's my main market, right. um, what's, there's already been a rule in France for a while against double representation, meaning you represent the player, you can't get paid by the club because then you're technically representing the club and the player. And right, they a conflict of interest. Right, and that's illegal here. So mm -hmm. we've all figured out ways around this, yeah. so applying it to other countries and making sure the countries are on board. I don't, if, if I think if I'm a player right now, I think I would want to pay my agent. I would want to, I wouldn't want the other, I, okay, I never was the type that, that wanted teams to do very much for me that I couldn't do for myself. So mm -hmm. I think if I had the option, I would want to pay my agent instead mm -hmm. of the team paying for it um, just out of principle. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can understand how agents now will want to figure out a way. It's, it's a very con con conflicting, no, a complex e uh, issue right now. And I, I think you're right. It's going to take some time for, for the dust to settle and for clubs and players alike and agents to mm -hmm. find that line. Of course, in different countries is going to be handled differently. It's, it's normal. But what do you think about if, if, if a player comes to you and says, I, I want to pay you, I don't want the club to pay you. Mm -hmm. how, do you how, how do you as an agent feel about that? Um, in that case, we'd have to be pretty clear up front with how this would work, dates to be paid by, the amount, um, if that were the case. And obviously, if she were looking for a certain salary, we'd say to the team, well, she's earning, let's say, 30000 commissions, 10%. We'll need to add 3000 onto that salary so that um, she is able to cover my commission without it technically coming out of her salary. That's another yeah. way. You negotiate the salary that the player is going to have, and then you add on 10% to that salary that the player would then use to pay the agent. The other aspect, business side of it, that to me is not very beneficial for the clubs is that anytime a team pays a player more money, they're paying taxes, right. social charges on that. But if they pay an agent's commission, there isn't because it's not a, a technically a salary. 
So clubs are taking hits from this too. Right. Uh, from, so it's in their interest as well to find uh, a solution. And like I said, uh, as of this point, we've been able to, in every case, get the team to pay. But like you said, if it's the player who wants to do that, then that's perfectly fine. But there need to be very clear boundaries, ideally in writing. That way there's not any confusion, kind of like what we do with teams. We make very detailed contracts, uh, prepare for everything, um, in every eventuality. And you do the same with the players. That way it's all in black and white and there's not any uh, issues, hopefully, later on. Right. Um, Val had a question. Actually, I think you answered. She asked, are the players getting paid more to accommodate the agent fee or is this the same salary as you used to get? But actually, you just answered that. In, in, yeah, in I have personal experience yet having to do that, but that would be one of my strategies um, is not asking the team to cover that 10% in the salary. But like I said, that's not beneficial for the teams. Yeah. So in that case, when we bring that up, they're like, oh, yeah, okay, well, uh, <laughs> we'll figure something out. Um, now I've got a teammate question from, from the stories. Uh, obviously, networking is important. How do you go about making and main, maintaining contacts with teams and decision making? How do you personally do that? Uh, I don't see it as all that different from what I do with players. That means you keep in touch with them. Um, they see you at games. They know that you're taking your job very seriously and not just looking to sign players for money, that you're actually providing a service, that you're following them, that you're supporting them. Um, that establishes trust between you and the team. Uh, you handle stuff correctly. You're honest. Um, yeah, so basically it's a very similar approach to what I have with my players. And when you establish that trust with the team, we might not always agree. I have no issue taking a team to court. That, but the teams always come back to me because they know they were wrong. And I'm just doing my job uh, as honestly as I can. So anyways, just to answer your question more clearly, lots of um, messages, emails. So for example, at the start of a season, uh, I'll send teams emails about our players that are in other countries or on other teams. You know, hey, check this out. Look what she's been doing. Here's some highlights. You know, just always keeping contact with them in the event that a player goes down, they know who's still available. I'll send updates about players who are ha perhaps still available. Um, and obviously giving them players uh, that I've sold, in a sense, sold, honestly, that I haven't lied about her height. I haven't lied about her skills. Um, obviously, I can't guarantee that she'll play always at 100%. That's just, we're not machines, obviously. Right. But, you know, the player is as what is expected 99% of the time. And that establishes a good connection between myself and the team. You spoke on it. Um, I'm sorry, can you hear my washing machine is really loud <laughs> i did hear it earlier but uh i i thought it was something outside but i think no, it's it, that's my washing machine and i didn't realize it was on when i came in here when i would have turned it off um but you mentioned it earlier that that you know you have, that's part of the business you have to go to games and, and as, as i as we talked about it last time you i see you always going to games yeah. um my thing is going towards Oh, this is annoying. Going towards, um, what are they called? Um, when you work with another agent, mm -hmm. right? Let's say you work with a, a, a company in America. Okay. You're the one going to the games. You're the one establishing these, these connections. How is it? I know you may not have a whole lot of partnerships with other agencies. I know you're very selective. Mm -hmm. But... How is it when you have a, a, a player that is actually represented by some, someone somewhere else, but you're also maybe trying to find them a job? How is it with the splitting of the commission between your agency and the other agency? Right. So um, like you said, we're very selective about who we work with. We only work with two agencies, two other ones. Mike Count, a huge WNBA agency who represents a lot of great talent, who was actually my former agent. And then a European-based agency represented by Alexandra Shaw with Scores First, who's uh, one of my favorite people. So uh, two agents that I trust who share the same values as I do, who treat their players like I do. So I only work with these people. And so when uh, it's time to be recruiting players in, in France, as I represent their players exclusively in France. Uh, I know their players almost as well as my own. Um, 
obviously not nearly not the same relationship, but I know what they're able to do. I know what they've done. And that way, when I talk with teams, I know what I'm talking about. I'm not just sending out a name and go have fun and figure out how she is. So I need to be able to sell my eight, my partner's players as well as my own. I think I'm losing you or is it me? No, I still hear you fine. I see you and hear you fine. Okay, uh, but that gets into another uh, slippery slope with conflict of interest. So, okay, I'm trying to sell my partner's players, but what if I have players that have similar mm -hmm. profiles, similar backgrounds, right. who am I going to push more? So that's where the importance comes in of having a partnership, a network where we minimize the conflicts of interest. So, for example, I'm a France-based agency, so I'd say about 90% of my players are French. I do some have some other nationalities, but not many. Um, and no one else in our network can recruit French players. Just like I cannot recruit WNBA quality Americans, just like I can recruit Spanish players because we have a Spanish partner in our network. That way we're not pushing one particular player more than the other. If a team's right. looking for a player, they're mine. If a team is looking for an American player, they're Mike's or a German player, they're Alexander Shaw's. So that really helps limit that conflict of interest that a lot of people talk about between European and American agents. Um, and then when a team likes one of my partner's players, we handle everything on the ground, meaning we help the player get out here, we help with their visa, uh, we keep in touch with the team whenever there's an issue and we are kind of the liaison between uh, the player, the club, and her agent. So luckily, because there's a great amount of trust between myself and my two partners, they let me talk to their players freely. They trust mm -hmm. me absolutely that I would not try and steal them. It's not even a right. thought. So I call them my adopted players because while they're in France, they are my players. Um, right. I, games. I look out for them. I establish a relationship with them. And when they leave, then, you know, uh, it's like they're leaving the nest, so to speak. But uh, we do maintain a you know, some communication just because there's a relationship established. But mm -hmm. um, that's part of why we're so selective is because it works so well. And then there's some other agents that work with whomever just to place players and there's no relationship whatsoever, no trust. And that's where we get into problems between exactly. state players, conflicts of interest, who's really working for who. I'll give an example of how this actually worked and how we ended up picking up a player because of this. Um, an American-based agent uh, recruited a French player from the States. He has a French partner in France who has a bunch of French players. This French player with the American agent was without a job when she should have had one, a very good player. Mm -hmm. Turns out the French partner was pushing his French players much more than her. So she ended up leaving her American agent and that French guy to come with us. So I told her, this is what's happening. Uh, he wants 100% of the commission because yeah. a partner gets 50%. 50 50 and yeah. so business and if the agent's just looking to make money of course they're going to want to put for the 100 percent, and that's exactly yeah. so but again i repeat this really depends on the agent who they work with their relationship and their network um like a WNBA quality player would not want to be with an exclusively european agent they need an american agent who has the WNBA exactly. and the powerful European partners like myself in France. But if you're a player who's maybe only looking to play overseas and that's really all you can uh, pretend, like realistically expect to do, yeah, in that case, why not look for a European based agent if you're exactly. not? So it's a case, again, most of this stuff is case by case. You can't really apply it to a whole group, but um, yeah, that's my take on it. I mean, when I, when I talk to the, the clients that I, that I advise, that's one of the things that I, I usually say, well, okay, if you want to go to Europe or if you want to go to Mexico, and it doesn't matter, if you want to go anywhere, um, why don't you get an agent from that place? If you want to go, if your dream is it to, to play in, in Germany, why don't you get a German agent? Why do you need an American one? And this is not, this is not to bash American agents. This is not to, to uh, that's not what I want to do at all, but it makes more sense to have an, an agent based where you want to go to cut out the middleman. So um, it's, it's, it's basically just like you explained. And, and okay, not everybody is fortunate enough to be able to get an, 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 a European agent sometimes. So sometimes you have to take the American and hope that 
their partners are not just pushing their own players instead of trying to get the, the half commission on, on a player that has the American agent. Sometimes beggars can't be choosy, right? But um, it just makes sen more sense to me to have an agent there where you want to play. So the thing is um, also France is a little bit different as well because I, I know when I played in France as well, um, France has, has, has a lot of different rules. And one of those rules is being that if a player wants to come to France, he has to be rep or she has to be represented by a French licensed agent. Right. Or their agent has to be partnered with a French license. Right. Um, which is pretty unique. It's not like that everywhere. No, I think I only one. And now I think, ironically, Hungary is starting to do something like that, where anyone who wants to sign a player in Hungary has to go through a certain process. It's not exams or anything, but some sort of process. I don't know. I heard about this through uh, my American, my American partner who was really complaining about it. But uh, uh, <laughs> But yeah, it is very much an exception to the rule where a country has its own specific license and only that person who has that license. Right. Yeah. Actually, I think it's a pretty good rule. I, I think it makes sense. Um, probably not every country is able to have high powered agents or, or high influential uh, agents everywhere. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think it's a bad idea to have, have the country have their, their agents doing the work i mean it's obvious you're going to the games you're traveling the games you're doing all of this stuff whereas maybe an american comes over once a year maybe maybe also, um, rules in the country and how it works so a country, exactly some of them are pretty standard and straightforward you sign any bat contract fiba contract in those countries it's fine but a country like france for example we don't have bat we have french right. work court and so you need an agent who knows what they're doing over here because contracts in other countries what three pages long four pages mm -hmm. ending here with yeah. trans there 15 yeah yeah that's crazy so um i well, you, you mentioned it earlier actually um about players competing for jobs same yeah. the same player competing for jobs how do you handle it in your agency that mm -hmm you don't have so many players of the same type right. that are com are literally competing for jobs um, and, and are un unsatisfied with that. How do, you, how do you do it with your agency that you don't have that kind of explosion? Um, well, first, when we recruit players, we pay very much attention to the kind of player they are, the position they play, their age, their experience, and we make sure not to recruit anyone else or not have anyone else like that already in our agency. Mm -hmm because that is one of our key selling points because we do have some other competition that basically just takes any, anyone who right. can ask it. Right. I'm like, look, you're already competing for jobs with players that are with other agencies. Why compete with players within your own agency? Your own, right. And I tell them, if you want to know exactly who we represent at your position, I'll tell you. And you'll see that there is no one at your age experience profile um, at your position. Mm. And, honestly say that. So that's one of our key um, selling points for our agency. And it's just a principle for me that like, like I said, when you're already out there, it's, it's tough. It's tough to find jobs for yeah. most. And you don't want to feel like, Hey, is my agent choosing me or this player to have this job? Who is she pushing or who is he pushing? Um, how come this player got this job and I didn't? I have the mm -hmm. same. I have the same experience as she does, the same position. So there's a lot of difficult questions I'd rather just avoid. So mm -hmm. uh, I nip it in the bud. And so we're really careful about who we recruit. But that being said, there are some agencies who have such huge reach and a huge network that they can take a bunch of players that are very similar and get them all signed. But it's more like throwing darts at a dartboard. You're just looking mm -hmm. to get jobs. You're not looking right. to build their career or help them reach their maximum potential. Um, I prefer this particular approach, but that's just me. I'm not saying my way is right. It's just what I prefer. Your way. Yes. What What do you think about, like you said, there's agencies that, that just kind of take everybody, right? And yeah. they're maybe not as selective. Of course, we all know it's you cannot guarantee that you yourself you cannot guarantee that you will find everybody a job. It's not possible. There's so many different 
conditions and, and factors that come into play. Of course, I'm sure you do your best and everything like that, but no agent can literally say, okay, I'm, I'm going to get you a job. Right. Um, I see that as a, a huge red flag when I look on agents' pages and I see just a, a huge roster of, of players. It, it, it makes me go crazy. How do you think that affects the, the names of agents when, when it's not your style, but agents may get a bad name, a bad rep, because they've got 10,000 people on their roster um, and you never really know if they're really getting these players' jobs? Mm -hmm. um how, how does that affect you as an agent when you see that um well to be clear there are quite a few good agencies who represent a lot of players but who do a good job keeping up with them uh just to give an example i know two agencies personally that both have pretty decent sized rosters and the big difference is one of them just sends out the list to his partners and their age, their size, their height, and that's it. No videos, no profile, no nothing. So that's the the classic throwing darts. Right. Basically, right. he's just. And there's another agent who has a lot of players, but he knows everything about them. He sends out updated videos, updated profiles. You can see he cares. And an agency like that, um, you need as an agency to be respected overseas, to be respected by teams. You need to have a decent client list. Um, it can, it needs to have enough decent players. You need to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of tricky to say you can't have too many players because, uh, that's not good. That's not always the case. You need a decent amount, but it's how you deal with your players. Um, if you have several at the same position, how do you go about that? And are you honest about that when you recruit players? And I like what you said earlier, um, agents that guarantee there's nothing in this business that's guaranteed no. absolutely nothing uh, so any agents that are giving you guarantees if it's exactly what you want to hear then <laughs> the, there's some red flags there there's some right. red so um what i try and do personally just because i like to have a personal relationship with each player i can't do that with 100 players i just don't right. have enough unless I want to get divorced and put my kids up for adoption. So <laughs> that's not really on my list of priorities at the moment. So I would say in our agency that we personally represent, we have around 50 to 60, mostly French, but Americans, Senegalese, British, Lithuanian, a, a mix. And I feel like that's a good number because uh, we have enough players that clubs like, Hey, they got people, you know, uh, they have decent client list, but I am able to, answer my clients calls answer my clients texts i'm able to really build their careers with them individually some need more personal attention some don't it's my job to adapt to them so i think a lot of it depends on the network that's there the staff um how the agent is working with these players it's only too much if you're not doing anything with them mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah yeah um you, you kind of just said it. How do you handle, this is actually not the question I wanted to ask next, but because you said it, it, it popped in my head. How do you handle a player that's stressful? I think we, we've all known, or I've known people that called their agents 20 times a, a, a day, and especially in the summertime, it's like, hey, you got a job for me? You got a job for me? You got a job for me? Like, how do you handle uh, a player that might be a little bit more stressful than someone else? Um. I find that being direct and very transparent and bluntly honest, but nicely to work <laughs> uh, just because a lot of times they're stressing because they don't understand their situation. They don't understand the process, the, the process in their own unique situation. So mm -hmm. why don't they have a job right now? Uh, explain the market, explain the number of players out there. Uh, for example, right now uh, there are four major leagues closed uh, Ukraine, Mm -hmm. Russia, well, it's technically there, but if you go there, I question your values. Mm -hmm. um, Korea and China are close to foreigners as well. So there's a lot of players on the market. So I find being honest and truthful with them and also teaching them kind of how this all works. I'm not, I feel like I also have an educational role uh, mm -hmm. to try explain the business to them so they understand what's going on. Um, also, to all, tell players that you need to focus on you because I feel like in the beginning until I have this conversation with players and I've had it with a few 
that everyone's looking at everyone else. Why yeah. they? That? Why not me? Uh, Why how, is she making this money? Right. And so I'll tell the first thing I'll say, hey, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. You're veering. You know, everyone's journey is different. Uh, maybe this player that got this, maybe she's already proved her, maybe she's already paid her dues. Maybe she's already have proven her experience and you haven't done that yet. There's usually always reasons for stuff. And if there isn't, sometimes it's just luck. Yeah. Luck. Yeah. This player maybe just showed up on the team's pay, uh, email thing at the right moment. But the best thing that players can do is focus on their own journey, on the, what their personal situation is. I see players sometimes, not personally, but I've heard of it. They give up great jobs because they're so focused on what someone else has instead of well, what they need, if that makes okay. sense. Right. So. What, um, when, you're, when you're scouting a, a prospective player, what do you look for in that player? Someone you're very high on signing. What, what are the things that you look at when you're looking to sign a player? All right. So forgetting the basketball side of it, I look for a player mm -hmm. who is very motivated and willing to put in the work because talent can only get you so far. I saw a quote today. It made me really, it was really interesting. It said talent, like your gift gets you into the room. Character keeps you there. Mm -hmm. So um, I look for that. I look for someone who's very open-minded, someone who might not necessarily have a lot of world experiences, but at least is open to the idea of new things because it's not just basketball that's going to yeah. make a successful career overseas, but also yeah. you being as a, a person, your mental fortitude. Um, I also look for players that I try, I try and do this with everyone to keep them humble. Uh, I feel like uh, getting a big head can just lead to really nasty places. <laughs> so I look for a player who's, um, you know, honest about themselves, who can admit to some faults. You know, uh, if a player says, I have no weaknesses, I have serious doubts about that player's ability to, you know, come to terms with some very hard truths. So I look for a good people who treat others with respect, you know, just an all around good person. Because like I said, the way I work, I like to establish relationships with my players. Is this someone I'm going to actually enjoy working with mm -hmm. for the foreseeable future? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we haven't had a player who's quit our agency yet. So um, who's left that's, us. That's, that says a lot because <laughs> it's very rare for, for a player to stay with an agent very long. Right, right. So you have to, and I feel like today, agents, a lot of agents can promise you can get a job. Yeah, but. Is it the job you need or want, should have? Are you taken care of? It's not just about the jobs. I'll give you another example. There's an American player, very good rookie who um, signed with one of those giant agencies that represent a thousand players and does the mm -hmm. dartboard style recruiting. And she got a contract and basically it was entirely one-sided for the team. Basically the team could cut her at any time before December, meaning there would be no negotiations for, you know, severance payment. Mm -hmm. uh, she could just leave. If she got injured, they would give her the rest of the month's salary and that's it. She's gone. Wow. And this is a big agency, a very wow. agency. And I was very surprised by that. Um, so just to say that some places just look to get you jobs, not necessarily a good job for you. I would have said, hey, wait, be patient. You don't need this. Odds are you probably won't get a big injury. You're very mm -hmm. good. Odds are you won't get fired. But stuff happens. You never know. Um, Val has a question. How much of career planning do you do with players? Like how far beyond the next season do you talk with them? From the basketball aspect, what we like to do is set short, medium, and long-term goals. Mm -hmm. And then every season I have a meeting with each player at the beginning of the season to, um, well, how do I do it? No, I do it at the middle of the season in December to talk about how the season's going, changes that need to be made, their feelings, what can be done differently, and to start thinking about the next year. And then I have another one at the end of the season to talk about how the season went, what needs to be done to get ready for the following season, workouts during the summer. So every year I do that. And mm -hmm. every year we have to change our long-term goals and um, medium term, I don't know how you say it anymore, I'm losing my English, uh, goals. Uh, because every year, you know, things come up, things mm -hmm. go better than expected, worse than expected. So mm -hmm. that's the basketball side. And then for post-basketball, that's something we do from the get-go. You need a plan B, always. 
you never know when you're going to have that career ending injury. Everyone dreams yeah. of that perfect retirement where you finish your career in front of cheering fans, your jerseys held in the, the rocking rock. chair. Right. So it rarely happens that way. If it does happen for you, be extremely grateful because it's the, it's not the norm. So especially with the French players, uh, just because um, I live here and uh, have more experience with that, we're getting them to do online classes, figuring out how to reconcile high level basketball and going to school just so that they know and have that reassurance that if basketball were to end unexpectedly, they're ready, or at least they have a path. Right. So um, we do that as well for our Americans. I talk to them about also what can they do while they're here? You know, it also is good to not be solely focused on basketball. It's good to study, do some online stuff, have other hobbies just to right. not have, burn right. Not have burnout. So um, uh, just to be honest, I don't do too much with the Americans as that's not really our market. Like I said, mm -hmm. with our network, I need to stay away from the high, high level Americans, unless I'm recruiting them with my American WNBA partner. Mm -hmm. But with the French players, we definitely do a basketball strategy along with a non basketball strategy. That way both are going in the right directions. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty dope because I can, I can remember <laughs> when I was being recruited from, from different agents that I had like seven to choose from. And I would get these brochures and everything and financial planning and this, that, and the other. I didn't see none of that after I signed on the line. Like there was no talk about, about what to do with my money, how to put some money away or, or things like that, or, and definitely, definitely not post career. I mean, no right. Way. So um, I appreciate the fact that you're, that you're thinking about your players' futures. And, and that's, I think that's really important. And I think it's very undervalued uh, by a lot of agents, but I can, I, I mean, I know what you're, what you're doing. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's, it's the way you're saying. So um, I, I really appreciate that. And, and it's, I, I really hope that a lot of players will start asking the, these kind of questions like, okay, well, what are we, your, your plans with me? And not just signing with an agent just because, just because. Or at least the agent has the connections because obviously an agent can't be a career planner. They can't be a mental coach. They can't, right. be, they can't be your so surgeon. So you have to filter out to people that they trust. Yeah. So those things. The agent's connected. Like we, even for our Americans, have very trusted people that we work with. We have a nutritionist who we work with. We have a mental coach. We have a, um, a weight strength and conditioning coach, all that stuff. We have people that we work with. And then after, do we pay for that service? That's the big question. It depends on the player. Um, if it's a player that's already well into their career and making good money at this point, I would tell them, Hey, invest in yourself. You know, right. I can help out a young player who's got very little money uh, for the moment, you know, I'll help out invest in that because this still is a business. There will be a return. And at the same time, we know very well, if we're not giving from ourselves, not paying ourselves even a little bit, we just, we don't take it seriously. We have that right. So a player, you know, who's already well established in her career making my, I'll set her up with the right people. Mm. Actually give her a very much reduced price because of our partnership, but she will need to pay for some of it because she's making more money than I am. And she has free housing and right. all that. <laughs> so, uh, right. No, it's taking, I feel like players also need to be more thinking about investing in themselves personally um, to, yeah, I get, do some, I remember Val talking about when she was playing overseas, you know, she did her master's degree, right. life coach thing, you know, she's a perfect example of someone who took care of business while right. doing, while they were playing, right. I, um, there's one hot take that, that I always get asked about and and about agents and this i truly believe it's one of those things like when i talk to my clients I, I i tell them that you only know if you have a good agent in one of three situations one is good and two are bad one is of course can they get you a job i mean that's the most normal thing in the world you would like an agent to, to actually get you a job that is suitable for you and your needs that's number one um, and number two and number three are, are somehow combined. Um, if you get hurt or if you get fired, 
Mm-hmm. Those are the two things when, when you know, okay, my agent is there. My agent yeah. is doing what what, I, what needs to be done. My agent is working on the settlement. My agent is looking for me for another job if, if I've just been fired so that I don't lose money. Or in the case of being injured, uh, my agent is there for me and, and maybe comes to the hospital or make sure I have the things that I need. Or um, also maybe working on a settlement, depending on how long you're out. Uh, and those are, are the moments, those are like critical and and important moments in a player's life because then it's a, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, I, and now I'm forgetting English too. I, I can think of the German word and I can't think of the English word. Right. It's, it's a critical moment. <laughs> it's a critical moment in a player's life that, that can determine a lot about their future. So right. a lot is going on in their head. Um, what do you think about that? Or, do you think that's, a, I know it's a blanket statement, <laughs> but, but in general, what do you think about that statement? I would agree because um, one of those options so about getting injured, that's something that you can't prevent and you can't anticipate. Right. So that needs to be something that's taken care of beforehand, meaning the contract, the contract. protecting you, meaning you at least get three months salary. At least all mm-hmm. of my players have something for the full length, whether because I sign them in countries that have good uh, health care, right. uh, make sure that they're, um, surgeries and any kind of medical help that they would need is fully paid for by the team you know so you just need to craw, yeah um, cross your t's and dot your i's right right forgetting that phrase in english it's so sad <laughs> um yeah so that part you need to have a good contract like i told you before that other agency where that player if she got injured she would have had nothing mm-hmm. she would have she tore acl she'd be on the plane as soon as she could First walk smoking. and good luck getting surgery at home without insurance Right. I would never, I mean, that's not my player. She probably will be soon, to be honest, but um, I would never have her sign that. I say, wait, mm-hmm. wait. Anyways, and then the firing is something that might not be prevented, but can be anticipated right. and prepared for. So that helps that I follow all of my players. I know how each player has done in every single game. So if I haven't seen them play that game, I've looked at the stats. I know what's going on, how they played. And so I'll see if a player is maybe not performing as she should. Mm-hmm. The fact that we have a good relationship, you know, we'll chat and see how it's going for her personally. If I see it's not going well, that she's had at least three games in a row where she's not getting the stats she needs, then I would start talking to her about, hey, what's going on here? Try and fix it. You know, see if there's something that can be done. Talk with the coach, you know, give her advice about how to approach this. And if nothing's working, then at that point, what I need to do is start keeping an eye out from other teams that are looking for players, start kind of preparing the grounds, so to speak. Right. And then when the team comes to me, they usually do. Um, we negotiate a severance package that's usually anywhere between one and three months. And also to work with the team on trying to get her a job. It's in their interest for her to leave quietly. So to be right. clear, team cannot legally fire you unless, of course, you had a contract like that one I saw from the other mm-hmm. player. But a contract is signed between both parties. They need you to agree to leave. Most of the time, it's better if you do, because even though the team can't fire you, they can make your life a living hell. Yeah. They can mistreat you. They can make you do extra conditioning workouts. I mean, you don't want to be where you're not wanted anyway. It's not good for your career or they'll bench you and you won't get a good contract. So it's in your interest to leave at that point. Right. Try and work out, you know, a correct severance package and also to have the team, you know, try and get her on the court more, play a bit more to help me sell her to other teams Mm -hmm. and hold on to her until I get her another job. That way. That's interesting. Yeah. And that usually works out pretty well. Um, And so far I've had good success with that. I mean, it's part of playing overseas. The best players have gotten fired. I've been there. Uh, yeah, we've all been there. It's part of the career. Sometimes you're in a place that doesn't fit your playing style. You don't, the coach and you don't have, a, don't see things eye to eye. Um, my job is to help you get past that. But if it's not possible, then we need to consider other options. And being fired is just unfortunately part of the business. So that mm-hmm. agent's job is to prepare the, prepare for that, anticipate it and be ready. And also explain to the player and be honest, you know, mm-hmm. about 
stuff. Be very transparent about the process, explain how it works, so that she can come to terms with what's happening and make a good decision. I feel like a lot of players make dumb decisions because they don't know what they're doing and they don't have the information to do so. So I'm more along the lines of trying to inform and educate players about the process. Um, let's talk real quick about players that don't have an agent and are looking for an agent. Yeah. So, of course, an agency like yourself, you, you, you can be selective and you can kind of pick and choose, okay, I would like to go with this player, I would like to recruit this player. But I'm sure you also get knocks on the door, emails from, from players that are looking for representation. Right. First question is, how do you handle with, when someone writes you and, and is, is looking for representation? And the second question is then, um, what would you advise someone who's looking for an agent, how to approach an agent? Right. So from my personal standpoint, um, because we're at a good number of players, like you said, I'm very, very selective. Um, I'm not going to necessarily take a rookie that would take me a lot of time to find a job for. It'd have to be someone, you know, really talented and where I can really do something with them. Um, so in those cases, the players write to me and I unfortunately don't have space or maybe have a player at their position. I'm honest with them. I'll tell them why. Um, that I'll thank them for reaching out to me, that I am available for any questions. Just because I don't represent them doesn't mean I won't help them. Right. Um, I've actually randomly found some players' jobs just because I had a team reach out. I didn't have anyone for them, and I referred them to this player and um, have found jobs that way. Or I'll recommend them to other agents that are just starting out. So everyone starts out somewhere. Exactly. I was a new agent too. So... Um, you know, it's just finding uh, an agent maybe looking to get into the business. In this case, you know, I would recommend to someone looking for an agent to write as many as you can, but also get referrals from your friends, from your coaches, from other basketball players. Also try and figure out what kind of agent you want. Is it an agent who's just going to find you a job? Is it an agent that you want to build a relationship with? That way you can kind of start interviewing some agents that you're interested in and see you know, how you feel when talking with them. Because this is someone you're putting your career into their hands. You're right. going across the ocean because this person has found you something. You know, if you don't feel good about that person, you're in a very dangerous, complex situation um, going overseas. You really want to make sure you trust the person that's putting you into that situation. Um, what else? But yeah, get a good highlight tape. Mm -hmm. Get two full game videos. I feel mm -hmm. like a lot of players don't, necessarily do that coaches usually like to see highlights in at least one or two full games your best games mm -hmm. not necessarily one where you score 30 points but one where you have rebounds assists, kills, good defense they want to see all around thank good you yeah uh what else would i say get your passports <laughs> have a job in august to get your passports um yeah so just random advice for newbies <laughs> Uh, primary weapon 24 actually just wrote a question um he asks wait it just went away um what's the best best place to look for an agent social media yeah maybe yeah there's eurobasket where yeah. a lot of are listed there's uh, fiba.com right fiba.com is good um I would look, yeah, like I said online google search social media an agent who's I wouldn't say every time, but an agent who's very active on social media with their players shows that they know what's going on with their players and that mm -hmm. they're putting time into showing what their players are doing. Right. As usual. So, for example, our social media page, I'm the one who does it. I don't have a social media person doing it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think, yeah, like you said, Eurobasket, FIBA, social media, Google, referrals. Yeah. I, think I, I usually tell players – that are looking for agents, first of all, probably the easiest and most effective ways of finding an agent is a referral. So my best friend has an agent. I tell my best friend, hey, I'm looking for an agent. Can you talk to your agent about me? But of course, you have to have the game to match. Like, right. not everybody's going to say, okay, wow, your game is terrible, but I'm not going to talk to my agent because then it looks, makes me look bad, right? <laughs> so you definitely have to have the game that matches what you're looking for. But talking to your friend who has an agent is, and gives you a, a good referral is probably one of the easiest and most effective ways. But, it, but it's not 
90 percent that it's going to happen for you no right. but it's probably one of the easiest ways right for sure and that agent might know other agents i've referred players, exactly you know ones that are good maybe not as powerful as we are but who could be interested in a in a player you know like that one who's starting out or one who's looking to build their client list or player or agents that i respect um but also to be fair in some cases, depending on the player, you don't necessarily need an agent to get overseas. Don't hesitate to send your highlights, video and stuff. Go on Eurobasket.com. They have all the teams out there. Send out your info to as many people as you can. See what happens. You never know, you know what kind of responses you could get. Um, I've had plenty of examples of players that I knew when I was a player who got their own jobs. Yeah, but do you think that that's kind of outdated? Because especially nowadays, I mean, I, I, I think about it like when I was coaching. Mm -hmm. I didn't use anyone except for the two to three agents that I was very close with that knew what I, what type of players I, I, I wanted, that knew um, what positions I was looking for. So I didn't get stacks from, from these agents. I got them from other agents mm -hmm. of player profiles. They specifically looked for the type of player that they knew I was looking for. Now, mm -hmm. that's okay. That was German first league. French mm -hmm. first league. I don't think anybody's gonna um, send a highlight film to, I don't know, to Paris, and and the coach is gonna be like, oh wow, I, I really like this highlight tape. It's, it's probably not realistic on very, higher levels. Very unlikely, true, but, but I lower think levels. You know, so I know some coaches. Um, you know, a lot of coaches know agents as well that can mm -hmm. be hooked up. The whole point is networking, getting your name right. out. Someone will notice, and who knows where that can lead you, but it's better than sitting at home and twiddling your thumbs. And um, if it's your dream to play overseas, it's tough. So I want to say everyone should get a shot, but at the same time, it's, 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 it's not easy. Not everyone, yeah. can, not everyone can do it. So there's also the aspect we need to be realistic. If you probably exactly. Division Two or JUCO averaging two points a game, you're probably not going to go overseas. Probably not. Or it'll be a very low level team. It, yeah. Start. Right. And, and then, we'll but if, the thing is, is of course you never want to dash somebody's hopes, right? Their dreams. Oh. And, and you want to support them. Of course they have to be realistic as well. And that's part of my, what I do as well as say, okay, this is the situation. This is what you might be earning if you're lucky. Right. So, um, I think there are, are ways to find to find these things out, even if you're writing to um, different clubs all all around. You just have to be realistic about the chances that you might not get a a, a contract. But at the same time, um, nothing is impossible. And and if you yeah. put in the work, it's going to take a hell of a lot of effort on your part. And I usually tell the people that I talk to and advise they've got to put in at least about fifteen to thirty minutes a day. And they've got to be writing. They've got to be liking things on social media. They've got to. They really have to invest a lot of time, right? Or possibly a very low return, if at all. Right, and also that's where it needs to come in. Where players need to realize the most important is exposure. That maybe that first year you might not get a big salary or even a little salary. You might get nothing. Uh, you might have, but for me, minimum flights, lodging, healthcare. Right. And if you're making enough to just pay your everyday expensive 300 a month, 400 a month, if that's right. all you get at that time, so be it. Go yeah. out, make a name for yourself, dominate. And then you're known uh, no longer as a rookie. And you're known yeah. now. You've got stats. You've got you stats, Right. And um, not every player is made for the overseas lifestyle. Okay. W stars who can't hack it over no. here. No. No. Teams are scared of rookies. Teams are freaked out by rookies. So you just want to get that first year over with, show that you can play overseas, that you can hack it. And then the second year, generally, if you play well, is much easier. Yeah. It, it usually takes a couple of years before before players establish a name and, and things like that. Okay, before I let you go, um, also, while these players are looking for clubs on their own, everybody can do it on their own, like you said. <laughs> But I really preach that they have to also be looking for an agent because just because you go to Portland's sure. fourth division 
and somebody sees, sees your highlight tape and they say, okay, we, we'd like to have you, you still need somebody behind your back if you get hurt, if you get injured, if, you get, if you're fired, things like that. So I always preach, hey, just because you got that job on your own doesn't mean you don't need somebody to protect well, your interest. That's right? So... Yeah, it's important to have an agent, but... Uh, geez, it sucks. I don't, I'm like going against my own job here. <laughs> you don't need an agent to get a job overseas technically. Obviously, having an agent, for sure, way better it is. Um, but in the event you don't have one, can't get one, don't let that hold you back. There's people exactly. like yourself who can help guide them, who have their own connections. You d Legally, you don't need to have an agent to sign a contract. Right. right. But, you know, but of course, you know, I'm always afraid for, for players that that don't have so much experience. The older I got, the less I needed an agent because then right. I had teams coming to me and I knew the, the pay scales better in different leagues and I had a lot more experience. And I also knew that if I got hurt or something like that, the... the the avenues I needed to take or what I needed, the steps I needed to, to do. But that doesn't happen until you're overseas for a long time. But especially players that are, that are looking for jobs by themselves, I'm really afraid that, that teams will take advantage of them, especially teams on lower, lower levels. Um, right. And, and that, that they, yeah, that they'll get it taken advantage of. So that's why I always preach, hey, even though you got that job on your own, very good, but try to get somebody to take notice of you and and be on your grind and look for an agent for sure and hope that that agent will be there for you in one of those three times that, that i mentioned before <laughs> so lauren thank you for part two of our discussion i'm going to get you out of here thank you so much i'm sure you dropped some gems just like last time and i also learned a couple of other things this First time tonight sean well yes. done yes yes and um i really appreciate you you know that and um and like I said before, um, it doesn't matter if if you're a you're a woman and you, predominantly with women, you have only partners, women. Or only, only, only women. Um, mm -hmm. The gems that you dropped tonight is unisex. It's not based on right. women or or men. It's unisex. So um, I appreciate the the knowledge that you that you gave. And oh, I have to. There was somebody that wrote a question, but I'm gonna. Uh, primary weapon. I'm going to answer that last question that you had. I'm going to answer that. Um, I'm going to DM you after this is over, and I'll, I'll talk to you about that. Um, but anyway, back to you. Thank you so much for jumping on once again, and I'm praying that it's that it's saved. I oh, I didn't do the screenshot. I didn't do the screen saving. Oh my goodness. I hope I hope it's saved. Anyway, so thank you so much once again. Get out of here. Have I'm a good. Say goodbye to everybody else. Run in Greece, right? Yeah, next week, out of here. I need it. I need the time off. Yeah, I feel you. All, All right, right. So get out of here. We'll talk. Bye. Thank you. So, teammates, once again, Lauren came through with knowledge left and right, and I hope some of you were able to soak it up and and really figure out the, the way that your career should go. And, and if you don't have an agent talking to you like, Lauren, just talk to us. Um, you need to find yourself a new agent, for real. So um, don't be afraid to ask your, your, your agent tough questions just because they're representing you. You need to ask tough questions. You need to figure things out. You need to ask them questions like, how many people do you have on your roster that play the same position as me or are the same type of player as me? Am I competing against other players on your roster? Don't be afraid to ask the hard question. It's your career, and if you don't ask the questions, no one else will for you. So, um, yeah, once again, thank you for for Lauren for hopping on. And I really appreciate all the knowledge that she dropped. And um, maybe someone can learn from this. And if so, please pass this knowledge on to others. That's very important to me that, that we share our knowledge and help the community grow and educate the community. Because if we don't do it, no one else will. And um, so, please, if, if this is something that might interest you or someone you know, please share that information on to the others. I will have this video up hopefully tomorrow morning, German time. And um, yeah, thank you for tuning in, whether you were here for one minute or for the whole hour that we were on live. So I've got a new, new Eurostep coming on Wednesday. I'm going to put out the promo for that 
right after I get off of here. Um, that it'll be a really interesting conversation because this is actually a player who would like to come overseas and has done a couple of camps, things like that. And so I really want to get into what someone who is trying to come over here and hasn't been over here yet goes through when they don't have an agent and they go through camps or combines or things like that. That's a very interesting topic. And I think the, the guest I'll have on will, will have a, a, a nice view viewpoint of that and share his experiences. So I'm really looking forward to that. And then I've got one also on Friday um, with someone, I'm not going to say anything about him, but um, a pretty, pretty interesting guest, I think. Um, and some of you probably already know him and, and know what he does for a living and things like that. So that promo will be out on Wednesday, probably. So yeah, that's it. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining and be safe. Old head out.